So dealing today with electrostatics, and therefore necessarily we are chemists, solvent interactions, I will remind you what the standard description of molecular electrostatics is based on. It's normally referring to things like multiple moments and charge distributions and charge densities. And we start in the usual place with just the Coulomb equation for the electrostatic potential. That's your charge density, that's the distance from every point of the charge density, and an integral of the density gives you the electrostatic potential. Its derivative is the electric field, and these things interact inside the molecules, electrons, and with the nuclei reactions between themselves, but also with the environment, namely solvent. Now, the way we deal with this, and to try and avoid storing the entire cloud for every molecule every time, is we use uh, the uh, Laplace expansion, and uh, this chap got his giant medal, no doubt, for this equation, because it must have been an absolute horror to derive. So that here is 1 over r minus r prime, so that's just 1 over the distance between two points in space. And the expansion is in spherical harmonics over the spherical rank. Uh, that's the smaller distance of r and r prime. That's the greater distance of r and r prime. These are the spherical harmonics of uh, the reference point, so where we are pointing and at what distance. And these are the spherical harmonics uh, that pertain to the density here of our electric charge. So if we put this giant expansion into this integral and um, rearrange it somewhat, we will see that we have the distance and the angles that pertain to the point at which we are calculating the potential, and then the distance and the angle that pertains to the cloud alone. And that, of course, can be calculated. It's the property of just the particular charge distribution. And these integrals, when you take them and make them numbers, are called multiple moments. And they come into the spherical harmonic expansion then of the electrostatic potential. And if we are outside the convex hull of the charge distribution, particularly at some distance, this multiple expansion is very convenient because we only need to store the coefficients of an otherwise known expansion. So they are a ground state property, but interestingly enough, they are famously hard to reproduce, even for the simplest molecule, uh, like carbon monoxide, you need to go to a pretty high level of theory. So that's our usual um, gradation, so that's just the Hartree fox so the plain self-consistent field. This is all the perturbation series, and these are the coupled cluster levels, all the way to singles, doubles, and perturbative treatment of triple excitations. And you can see, so that's the experimental dipole moment of the carbon monoxide, and the heart fog doesn't even get the sign correctly. And of course, it feels like such a trivial property dipole moment. And so the people who wrote the first quantum chemistry package that did these calculations have spent an inordinate amount of time looking for a lost minus in their package. They couldn't believe that not even the sign is correct in such a trivial property, but as you go further and further up the ladder of the accuracy, so at CCSDT level, you do get roughly the right number. So rather hard to reproduce. And then because these multiple moments, they include nuclear charges, they also depend on the nuclear position, and therefore the quality of the geometry of the if we are looking, for example, at the excited state uh, of a particular molecule, like uh, here formaldehyde, then it really matters whether we have kept the ground state geometry or we have, in fact, re-optimized the excited state geometry. You can see the uh, type of moments, so mu x and mu z, are changing completely. Right? So we would not even get the right order of magnitude and occasionally the right sign if we did not re-optimize the geometry to target the particular excited state in this case. And of course, these are not the energies, and so the variational theorem does not apply. The higher level 
of the electronic structure theory and the bigger basis does not necessarily guarantee a more accurate answer. So that's uh, an example here of two D of T exchange correlation functions, Miller Placid and CCSDT, and these are the lines corresponding to the experimental value in the gas phase, and you can see there is no systematic trend in here. One has to be careful, um, and uh, likewise um, in this case. And these are vibrational uh, excitations, and of course we must have also vibrational averaging of some kind because vibration means the nucleus moves, nucleus moves means the charge moves, charge moves means a difference in the electrostatic multipole moments. So they depend on absolutely everything, right? The basis, the level of electronic structure theory, whether or not the geometry is right, even for tiny molecules like that. So occasionally even thermal average at a finite temperature is necessary because different vibrational and rotational states would be populated to a different extent in different temperatures. So surprisingly difficult to model. Which of course brings us to the fact that even if in the gas phase these are such difficult properties, in the condensed phase things get seriously important and must be considered. And so this brings us to the main topic of today's lecture, that is salvation effects. Some of you, or those who deal with magnetic resonance properties, will have to take these into account pretty much every time you're calculating anything theoretically. So what are we looking to reproduce and capture? Well, we need some non-specific interactions, simply the fact that we would have polarization of the solvent by a charge that we place into it. Some dipoles, if we put them in some electric field gradients, will orient themselves. Some quadrupoles will orient themselves in high derivatives of electrostatic potential, and so on. We will have specific interactions, hydrogen bonding in water, in ethanol, and such like. We will have Van der Waals interactions with dispersion, uh, polarizability driven interactions where things just stick uh, to each other. And then charge transfer effects, so certain molecules would switch their ground states to some charge separated states if those become a bit more favorable in a solvent relative to vacuum, and they normally would be because you've got uh, an attenuation by a factor of 80 in water, for example, and so some charge separated state that would have been very unfavorable in vacuum, if it's hard to pull those charges apart, would become more favorable in a solvent. And then all the thermodynamics and statistics like hydrophobicity, like solvent shell structure around the ion. Those of you who did your undergraduate degree in chemistry remember all of those factors and how they influence things like even the color of some transition metal complexes. Uh, examples of the energetics involved, these are salvation energies in kilocalories per mole of basic molecules. You can see very significant. Things like barrier height for methyl group rotations in the solvents, or rather environments in this case, of different dielectric constants would be very different indeed. So methyl groups would rotate at different rates depending on the surrounding electrostatics. And we must model it all. So how would we try to do that? Well, we can simply put a couple of solvent molecules in explicitly. We can say, fine, we are running the calculation at some Hartree Fock level, at some DFT level, at whatever. Why don't we just put a few water molecules in some places that look like there may be a hydrogen bond there or a strong charge? Or we know from experimental evidence that the water molecule is sitting in a particular cavity or a particular so we could treat it at the same level of theory. We could treat it at a lower level of theory and use embedding methods like onion, uh, look it up in the Gaussian manual. We could treat water at the molecular mechanics level, so as a collection of charges and perhaps polarizabilities, which would reproduce all of the electrostatic stuff, none of the electronic structure theory effects, 
we could go somewhere in the middle and use all of those semi-empirical methods that fudge multi-center integrals. We could say, well, okay, our big molecule may be described at an appropriate level of theory, but who cares about the tiny details of the electronic structure theory of some surrounding solvent, so they can be treated somewhat simpler. Or we can simply say, okay, molecule is substantially a cavity in a liquid. That cavity will have image charges if the molecule is charged, and we could account for our solvent implicitly by just processing the effect of those image charges on the inside of the solvent cavity based on the polarizability of that cavity. Or we can use some hybrid or with or both. We can have explicit water in some important location. Uh, and have implicit water surrounding the entire thing. So let's take a look at how that is done, and thankfully this is implemented in the software packages that you are going to use. So starting with the explicit, the best um, well way that is used in molecular dynamics is just collection of charges. And uh, there's been some historical evolution there, so people started with the intuitive idea called SPC, simple point charge, where we simply just take the known geometry of the water molecule, put a charge here, a charge here, a charge there, and fit them to experimental data, for example, density, or boiling point, or refraction index, or some such thing. Essentially, there are charges, um, there are distances, there are angles here, which are simply varied until the properties of that molecular dynamics water match some experimental data. This turned out to be an awful idea and uh, well, simply the properties could not be reproduced with sufficiently high accuracy. And so the next generation of these models started putting additional charges which are strictly speaking not a part of the structure, but of course we do know that this is an electronic structure, right? The density, so we just put the charges that reproduce some multipoles that are necessary to reduce the necessary boiling point, for example. And so this tip uh, family of models, transferable intermolecular potential, they input additional so tip 4p uses four point charges so there's one extra here and tip 5p places additional point charges roughly where you know naively you would have the lone pairs of the oxygen atom placed with the partial negative charge and once again we fit experimental data and get all of those parameters until we are happy with how those experimental things are reproduced. And these are those things, so density, overall density, is well done at the three levels of team 3p, so close to the experimental value. The enthalpy of vaporization, you can see the energetics can be reproduced pretty well, right? likewise uh, the overall energy here. Heat capacity, can be a problem. Interestingly enough, the simple models, tip 3p and tip 4, get the heat capacity close to the experiment, whereas in tip 5p the water has too much heat capacity. But the people who designed tip 5p considered other parameters, you will see them in the next slide, structural evaluations, and very importantly, viscosity to be a higher priority uh, than the heat capacity in this case. Uh, and there are other thermodynamic um, and statistical parameters. Uh, this is compressibility, um, that I think is some scattering parameter, uh, and um, occasionally you get them dead wrong at every level, and uh, predictably because these are just collections of point charges, which we literally just input into the electronic, uh, into the magnetic, sorry, the, the molecular dynamics force field in this case, uh, and alter until they match some experimental data. So these models are designed to reproduce structural and thermodynamic properties of water. And an example of a structural property is this radial distribution function measured with X-ray or neutron scattering uh, or whatever it is that people are using these days. And that's the probability density of the nearest oxygen from the current 
if you are sitting at a particular oxygen, so what's the probability of there being an another oxygen at a particular distance? So there's obviously a peak here corresponding to the first salvation shell, and then it bubbles all the way to infinity. And you can see tip 3, 4, and 5p water models, they progressively approach this crystallographic uh, radial distribution function. Uh, likewise, for the OH distance, we are sitting on an oxygen, what's the probability of there being a hydrogen a given distance away? You can see it gets better and better. So excellent agreement with experiment on the distance correlation function and uh, a pretty decent agreement on the dielectric constant, so that's the tip 5p, that's the experiment, even as a function of temperature. But you start having a closer look and you realize that even the dipole and the quadrupole are completely dead wrong. So these are experimental values right, for the dipole and the quadrupole moment of a water monomer, and this is what the tips are producing for both, and you can see they are not even close. So bulk properties have been reproduced at the expense of the individual molecular properties, so large deviations, and of course this is simply the fact that a bunch of point charges at a distance is certainly not a good approximation, and I'm not showing you the more sophisticated models that MD people are using these days, but you can introduce polarizabilities into that system and uh, then it improves first. Um, of course, we could say, well, okay, why don't we stop using point charges and start treating water at a higher level of series? So if we go into the cell consistent field models with the semi empirical treatment, those are awful. So that is a comparison of MD with AM1 semi -empirical. And you can see, so that's the experimental, um, again, radial distribution function for the OO, OH, and HH. And AM1 is just awful, much worse than those fitted um, point charge systems have been. So the semi empirics completely failed to reproduce even the structural properties of liquid water. Hartree Fock is a little bit better. In this case, the experimental are these uh, rhombuses here. So the AM1 is this awful agreement there. Hartree Fox pretty close. Um, the fitted point charges are closer still. So as soon as you start processing multi center integrals reasonably correctly, it gets better, but still, uh, of course, Hartree Fox is going to be very, very expensive on the scale of the salvated molecules that we have. We will probably have you know, some giant protein with a couple of uh, hundred or even thousand water molecules around it, and of course it's completely unrealistic to do that with some consistent field methods. So we have to do it with the um, molecular dynamics versions somehow. Okay, so this is explicit water models. What about implicit ones when we treat the solvent as a cavity that has image charges which that have Coulomb interactions with the electronic structure we are dealing with. Well, that is clearly something we must do, right? That's an example. That's the dipole moment uh, of, um, I don't remember which nucleic acid base, uh, or actually all of them. Uh, here, gas relative to chloroform, relative to water, and you can see the difference can be um, 30% or thereabouts, so clearly important. And uh, there are simple cavity models, which really are so simple as to be completely wrong. Uh, the famous joke about uh, a spherical cow in vacuum uh, in physics actually originates from the early work on these simple solvent cavities, which couldn't reproduce even the basic properties of the molecules in there. So if we look at uh, the spherical cow in vacuum, so just literally a spherical cavity with a charge inside, then we can calculate uh, the Gibbs free energy of all that electrostatics um, analytically, and uh, we get an expression for that. Turns out to be no good. We can say, well, okay, it's not just the charge, maybe we should consider a dipole moment as well, in which case the dipole contribution is added to it and it's still no good. Then we can say, well, okay, we can make it a polarizable dipole with some polarizability and still 
complexity and you get a more complicated expression and it's still no good and then you can stick a full multipole expansion of the electrical statics of the molecule and the cavity consider it a spherical or elliptical and it's still no good so uh, this is a um, funny bit of history but of course we have to do better with the description of the solvent cavity and uh, one of the ways of doing better is to take the actual surface from the real molecule so as a van der Waals surface or more complicated surfaces and consider the breakdown of the total salvation energy into the energy of forming this cavity and we of course have to work against the surface tension when we are making the cavity simply just creating it is a cost in the energy there will be electrostatic contributions from just the Coulomb interaction and there will be dispersion contributions from all the polarizabilities that get activated when those charges are present so the simplest thing is the van der Waals surface just the union of the van der Waals spheres of individual atoms uh, turns out to be too close to the bone um, a better surface is uh, what was called solvent accessible surface when we take this van der Waals surface and we roll a sphere on it with a radius roughly matching the radius of our solvent molecule and so if we trace this center then the resulting surface here so the Lee Richard surface of the same protein is roughly the solvent accessible surface of this molecule or we can cut it a little bit closer we can instead of the center we can look at the nearest point and that's called the solvent excluded surface and then these surfaces and the image charges there are significantly more accurate and when you run the benchmarks these are the surfaces that actually do reproduce the relevant electrostatics quite well now you can see this surface has been mapped with the electrostatic potential and there are parts there that are strongly positively charged strongly negatively charged and then there will be the corresponding solvent response to that surface how do we calculate that response standard electrostatics image charges are proportional to the local electric field what's local electric field that's the gradient of the potential in this case we need to calculate the gradient in the direction that's perpendicular to the local surface so the normal direction and so we have d by d normal of the local electrostatic potential calculated from the inside so we need the image charges on the inside of the surface and that is just the polarizability term and so that's our surface that's our solvent accessible surface obtained by rolling the charge and then this is how the image charges are computed we need to discretize this obviously then triangulated account for all the areas and the giant family of models where this is done is called polarizable continuum model substantially what we are doing is we are solving Poisson's equation for charge dynamics on the surface that we have made here and there are various levels at which this could be done generally speaking they are just using Green's function for Poisson's equation to solve for the electrostatics but um, you can use the original surfaces that I've described in the previous slide but they have a bit of a trouble in that they are very sensitive and in a nasty way to changes in molecular geometry when we start optimizing the geometry to get some equilibrium structure, what is going to happen is atoms are going to move, the corresponding van der Waals spheres are going to move, and then what is going to happen is that the tessellation of the solvent accessible surface is going to change. In particular, it may be abruptly gaining a point, losing a point, depending on whether something becomes more or less accessible which plays havoc with numerics because when you've got a finite discretization then losing a point from a surface is a jump and so the calculation of molecular geometries with this original solvent excluded PCM surface is a bit of a pain they get stuck they don't converge and a better idea is instead of using this solvent accessible geometric reconstructed surfaces we can simply take an isosurface of the electron density 
and icy surfaces are easier to compute, they are less sensitive to movements of atoms, they are easier to tessellate because they are smooth, they don't have corners that you have to smooth around, like the solar accessible surfaces we have. So ISA density PCM essentially reruns the self-consistent field, so it's a hard to talk about, loop or whatever else you have there, recalculates the cavity, and it repeats those SCF calculations with the image charges that proceed from that cavity, iteratively until self-consistency of the cavity as well, so until the cavity no longer changes. That is a long story, and a better method, and the one that's currently probably the best um, implemented in Gaussian as well, is to dynamically update those charges within the hard fork loop itself. So we achieve convergence simultaneously on the self-consistent field and the image charges in that cavity. Rather expensive, but works and has much better numerical performance and stability with respect to geometry optimization than um, all of the methods that are above in this slide. Quite expensive though, because interactions between electron density and charges are the origin of all those complicated integrals that we have there. Be prepared to sacrifice at least a factor of 10 in the performance when you start dealing with that. So that's the whole clock time of a vacuum calculation, a polarizable continuum direct, so just one um, iteration polarizable continuum iterative uh, with um, the hard refock on the inside and the self-consistent ice density PCM which is inside the hard refock loop and you can see the difference between the wall clock time in vacuum and the wall clock time in the solvent is phenomenal so this is the most stable method and the one that is also the most expensive. Once again these are external self-consistent electrostatics which means that the variational theorem with respect to the basis set no longer applies and so you can see you do get some systematic changes with respect to the basis set as you increase it but they can easily cross your experimental data and keep going out in the distance so in this case when you get a bigger basis the accuracy actually gets worse so same advice as ever check the literature for which methods have been benchmarked and found to be working well for your particular property, in this case, salvation energies, and then use those methods. Even the SCI PCM would not converge your geometry to the same accuracy as you can do it in vacuum, so it's a good idea to relax your convergence criteria by an order of magnitude or so, so that you're converging not to one thousandth of an angstrom, but perhaps to one hundredth of an angstrom that is more realistic when such um, external calculations are present. Of course, we can do both, and that is really the recipe that uh, I want you to take away from this lecture every time you are computing things, particularly magnetic properties, which we will be dealing with in a couple of lectures from now. So hyperfine couplings, uh, G-tensors, and things like that, they are very sensitive to electrostatics. And that's a stereo plot of, I think, a tyrosyl radical in this case, with every significant hydrogen and every significant lone pair capped respectively by the oxygens of a water molecule and the hydrogens of a water molecule here. So two lone pairs that chemists would expect here have been capped by water hydrogens the three hydrogens of the NH3 plus group have water oxygens compensating the charges. This carboxylic group also uh, has water sitting on it. And once you do the, for example, hyperfine coupling calculations there, you match the experiment pretty well. And this is a very difficult uh, thing to get right because of the sensitivity of the aromatic system, in this case, to the external electrostatics. So if you want to calculate your magnetic properties in this case accurately so the procedure is you add the first salvation shell explicitly and if you're a physicist tough luck you wouldn't have a clue where to put those waters so find your nearest chemist 
and shake them until they tell you where the water should be sitting. Then put waters into there, put the whole thing into a polarizer, will continue, rerun that calculation. And uh, Dunkey's years ago, uh, so this is from actually, this is from my PhD thesis 22 years ago now. That was a weekend long calculation. Now it's probably a couple of minutes on your laptop, but the principle hasn't changed. So add the first salvation shell explicitly, put the complex into the PCM solvent, and this is what you want to run. That is the convergence of uh, the G factor uh, deviations from isotropic electron G factor as a function of um, the solvent polarizability scaling. So that's um, I think pretty much vacuum and that is the polarizability that we want and you can see that there is a dependence there as well so G factor is sensitive to it and the same story uh, with respect to the level of theory if your solvent electrostatics is not treated well it doesn't matter which level of theory you choose for the electronic structure in this case for water for example as you start with hartree fock MP2 configuration interaction MP4 coupled cluster and the stupidly expensive coupled cluster ST with perturbative triples, your accuracy gets worse. So this is um, a sort of delicate thing where you really do need to use your chemical intuition to set the correct model for electrostatic interactions. Otherwise, it doesn't matter what level of theory you are performing your actual calculation at. Okay, so that was individual molecules. Let's now take a look at the statistics of what goes on around something big, like a piece of DNA, for example. And you know that phosphate groups of DNA are ionized, so a strong negative charge on the DNA strand. Unless we put counter ions around it, the calculation is simply just going to explode. Certainly in vacuum, the DNA simply doesn't exist because it's electrostatically unstable. So in water it does. And then, okay, if we look at the energy of an electric charge, well, that's the definition of the electrostatic potential, right? That's the energy of the problem of the charge that you put in a particular location. So if that's the electrostatic potential, then multiply it by the probe charge, and that's going to be the energy. The energy then goes into the Boltzmann law, which gives us the probability density of those charges sitting there at some temperature. So we can say, okay, assuming we had some charge concentration overall, that the concentration of positive and negative charges will be determined by the Boltzmann probability factor, which is this energy divided by kT with the minus sign. So these are Boltzmann weighted concentrations of positive and negative charges at a particular temperature in a particular potential. But of course, the charges themselves would then modify the potential. So what we really must have then is we have a charge density sitting in this potential, which will be the difference between the density of the positive and the negative charge. And we can put those expressions there. But then, of course, this density through Poisson's equation determines the potential itself. Reminder that the Laplacian of the potential is proportional to the charge density. And so we take this charge density here and put it there, and we are going to have a horribly complicated partial differential equation that was a potential. So the Laplacian of the potential here depends in a horrible exponential way on the potential itself. So if we put that into there, simplify, reorder, we get the equation that's called Poisson Boltzmann equation that gives us the equilibrium potential that comes from the self-rearrangement of charges at a particular temperature with some initial concentration and some polarizability around some you know setting like an electrode in electrochemistry or a piece of DNA in the biochemistry. Of course this assumes the presence of independent point charges which are moving around so this is not applicable to dielectric liquids but it is applicable to liquids like water 
with dissolved ions in it. And if we run such calculations, so that's the stereo plot of DNA uh, with water density in blue around it uh, and sodium density in red. And uh, because this is so negatively charged, there's barely any chloride around, it's a tiny little blob here and here. So that's the distribution around the DNA molecule. And then we look at the total potential, take a convolution with the charge density, and this is our electrostatic energy, well at least results the energy contribution here. So these PDEs are sold numerically, the resulting potentials determine the electrostatic current of the free energy statistic in this paper. But thankfully in this course I will not be asking you to do any such statistical calculations. All of the calculations you will be dealing with are single molecule or their roles in some electrostatic environment. And then, of course, hydrogen bonds. Well, thank goodness, and there's been a huge debate about that in the literature, but that is settled. Your average bulk standard hydrogen bond is predominantly electrostatic. So whatever gets the charges roughly correct is going to get the hydrogen bonds roughly correct. So some good DFT, for example, is OK. And I've put in a few um, statistics tables in here. Uh, hypnotize those uh, tables at your leisure. Uh, the experimental uh, value in this case, so oxygen, oxygen distance and the water dimer is roughly three uh, angstroms and these are deviations from that distance. You can see, strangely enough, Hartree folks doing pretty well. MP2 doing pretty well in the opposite direction. CCSDT is slightly better. Uh, but uh, this is an awful exchange correlation function, I think. Um, that does terribly in this case. Um, blip is okay, P3 blip is also okay. So there are good exchange correlation functions, as I'm sure you knew, and there are bad ones uh, in this case on the electrostatics. Uh, and uh, basis set superposition error, of course, also rears its ugly head. You will be dealing with non covalent interaction there, and it is important to make sure that you don't have any basis set superposition effects. And they predictably diminish as the basis set gets bigger and bigger. So if you get some giant triple zeta polarized basis with diffuse functions, uh, then the counter post correction error to BSC is quite small, and uh, with this quadruple zeta basis set, it's basically zero. So tiny, but be careful, you need to take that into account. Very occasionally in chemistry, there are hydrogen bonds which do have significant covalency. This is normally the case when there's some electron delocalization from nearby multiple bonds. So this cyclic structure, that structure, that structure, do actually have either the proton jumping between the two pretty much identical energy uh, minima on either side, here and here, or there's certain covalency across that bond. Such things do require significant post hardship corrections because, well, uh, they do have covalent character. And in a lot of cases, even the born oppenheimer approximation would be breaking here. So be careful with things like that. Um, they do require rather careful consideration. So hydrogen bonds, ordinary hydrogen bonds, easy peasy is complicated. Nasty hydrogen bonds, you still have to do them at high level post hardship more about non-covalent interactions, of course, if we have one molecule and another one coming close, it would be terribly naive to say that, okay, we have the Hamiltonian here, we have the Hamiltonian there, and we have the electrostatic interaction between them, but of course it's not just simple static electrostatics. What is going to happen is the polarizability of this molecule will kick in, and so the charge here will create image charges there, so their electronic structures will rearrange, and uh, they will, um, if they're both neutral, actually in a lot of cases stick together as a so-called Van der Waals interaction, but if we start accounting for that, so that's the energy of the two molecules together, that's the unperturbed energy of molecule A, of molecule B, 
that is simple electrostatics so the ground state of a ground state of b and then just the electrostatic term in there that of course is just the first order correction in perturbations here and the second order correction does involve a sum over all of the excited states hartree bock does not consider those excited states and so this will be absent in a lot of hartree fock and a lot of early exchange correlation functions in DFT. In order to get polarizability effects, you do need at least MP2 and at least um, uh, you know, some level of configuration, interaction, or couple of cluster methods. So, because you are summing all of those exciting determinants. And uh, these are examples. So, even you know, high level CCSDTs in large basis sets. Uh, that is the benzene dimer, so the benzene does stick to itself. At certain levels of theory, you will get the exchange, uh, the interaction potential that is completely uh, wrong. Uh, certainly, DFT gets it dramatically wrong. And uh, that's an example of different types uh, of MP2. So, you do have a minimum uh, there. But it's important to also account for basis sets of propositional effects. So counter counter post correction in here is quite important, otherwise the depth of this energy minimum is inherent. So essentially MP2 in triple zeta basis sets is generally okay for this sort of polarizability non-covalent interactions, but you will need to take into account the basis sets of proposition error as well. Okay, I think that's uh, pretty much it for non-covalency and electrostatics. I will just briefly mention one other property that you will quite often encounter because a lot of the readout of your quantum devices is optical readout. So you will be looking at optical absorption. So UVV spectra. Of course, the energies you have there are determined by just the energy differences between the ground state and some excited state. You will need configuration interaction for that or couple of cluster. And the transition moments that determine the optical density of your substance come from the dipole interaction operator. So the uh, various transition moments are a function of the expectation values with different um, determinants on either side of these operators. So these just matrix determinants. And I will remind you again that there's a difference between vertical absorption, right, where the geometry doesn't have the time to rearrange, likewise vertical emission, and the adiabatic absorption and emission, where this is strictly the energy difference between the two minima, because the nuclei had been given the time to rearrange themselves and, and uh, dissipate the excess energy. So that's the adiabatic energy difference, and this is a vertical energy difference, as you can see, these are three different numbers vertical absorption, vertical emission, and then adiabatic excitation that you need to be aware of. The accuracy, of course, these are excited state properties, so you do need configuration, interaction, or coupled cluster. You will never get line weight uh, correct, because line weights are dynamical properties that depend on the probability of excitation and de-excitation in some external noise that is present in your Hamiltonian electromagnetic mostly so you will get the optical absorption line positions from these calculations but never the width and width even today cannot realistically be computed because either we don't really know the nature of those perturbations that cause those transitions or we do not have enough statistics on the various spectral power densities of those perturbations so line widths uh, cannot be done Transition moments are only qualitatively correct because of all of those vertical versus adiabatic versus nuclear motion versus vibrational averaging versus non Ronald-Benheimer effects and such like. So only qualitative. And of course, all the standard warnings from earlier in this lecture about treating your electrostatics right. A lot of molecular excited states are charge separated states whose energy is going to depend strongly on how well you are treating your solvent effects and then the various vibrational energy effects in there. And there's again a giant table that I will not discuss uh, for you to hypnotize about the effects of the level of theory 
uh, on the various excitation energies. But in a lot of cases, you do need the double excitations because the contribution from them is significant. Okay, um, that's me. So the message of the lecture is you very rarely have things in vacuum. You probably have them in a solvent and you really, really need to get the solvent accounted for. Otherwise, there's a very real chance that the calculation is going to be completely wrong. Any questions?